to a God that decides everything, like Christians think, like Hindus think, like Jews think, you know. All of this thinking falls short of actually solving the problem. There's one paradox or another that will always haunt us. So what is the solution to this particular paradox? Solution is obvious within us. Solution is that there is no body that chooses, no individual that chooses, but it's the totality of consciousness. So who chooses? One and no one. One meaning one consciousness, or you can call it also no one consciousness. You, you know about this light bulb jokes? How many people does it take to change a light bulb? If you know about it, it's very common in America, we make jokes of it. Originally it was a Polak joke. How many Polaks are people from Poland? And they are a little bit lesser than the regular American or, you know, British origin or uh, not Western European at least. So it's a, how many Polacks does it take to change the light bulb? Twelve. Why? Because one person will do it, but eleven people will hold the person up. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. It, it's silly. <clears throat> but the best pol the, uh, joke of this kind of heart is how many Buddhists does it take to change the light bulb? And the answer is one and no one. See the One and no one. Because in Buddhism, no one. Self is nobody, no self. So it is, it is that kind of answer that we are giving here. Who chooses? It's one conscious. So who chooses? Who gets to choose out of the two observers? Either we said that their consciousness is one, or we said there is no one that chooses. The Buddhist description is also okay. No one that chooses, choice happens. We can call it that way. It's completely okay to say that. That choice is taking place. We avoid. So we can describe this as a fullness, like in Hinduism, or we can describe it as a nothingness that chooses. There is there's no question, there is no individuality here. Okay? Fullness or nothingness, what they call it, depends on our wanting to describe in this way or that way. Purna and Shunya. Shun, we can say Shunya because it is not a thing. You see, that is it. It's not a thing. It's not an entity. Whether we call it fullness, one consciousness, like Hindus do, or whether we call it nothing consciousness, nothingness, it's a choice. It's, you can choose the words as you like. There's no word that will perfectly satisfy it. Then what we do, we say conscious. We just say conscious. Conscious. So what is conscious? It's coming back to your question. Okay, we are getting at it. We are getting at it. Gradually the understanding will time. So to summarize, <clears throat> what is happening? We are getting an answer from all these paradoxes that says First of all, what are the unambiguous positions that we can take? First of all, there is the domain of potentiality. This is not ambiguous. Because experiments show that there is indeed way of possibility. And they reside in this domain that can be defined as the domain through which communication does not require any signal. Right? This is unambiguous. Quantum physics absolutely demands that this is true. There is no compromise here. Indeed, there is a domain of potentiality defined by the fact that communication is instantaneous in this domain. And because communication is instantaneous in domain, in this domain, therefore this domain is oneness. All interconnected instantly. That's what we mean that there is only oneness, one without a second. So consciousness is the domain of potentiality where all is one. The way that it came to me, that uh, precious day of 1985, I was arguing with this mystic and mystic says, there is nothing but God. And I tell you, 
what was my problem with depressed? There is nothing but God. Nothing but God. It's a Sufi saying, and I knew Sufism by heart because I have read it for many, many years. My objection was always that this is not true. There is nothing but God. I can theoretically see, okay, you are God, I am God, you know, like Hindus say, or Muslims say, good Muslims would always say, yeah. Hindus they will do bad. We, we bow and we acknowledge the godness of you, wonderful, so what say, you are that, I am that. But I don't feel that way, no. I have never, before I became two quantum physicists, never felt that you and I are one. Never. I'm separate. Yeah, right? I am so. Right? So when mystics say there is nothing but God, what do they mean? I got lost in that. What happened that particular night, and I remember it distinctly, what happened was that I realized all of a sudden that mystics are not talking about this reality in which we see things. We experience things. This reality is inherently separate. They are talking about the domain of potentiality. They didn't have the right name for it. So the big discovery of quantum physics is to give it a name. The ancient people gave it all kinds of names, of course. They called it heaven and kingdom of God. And, but we have never understood it. When Jesus says kingdom of God is everywhere, it doesn't mean kingdom of God is everywhere on earth. He means kingdom of God is everywhere in heaven. And that's the part we missed. It came to me in crystal clarity that the mystics are talking about the domain of potentiality. In the domain of potentiality, there is only consciousness and its possibility. And that's the unit that Shankara said, one without a second. There's nothing other than this one consciousness. And all possibilities are the possibilities of that one consciousness. Okay. Now, I want us to stay with it. it. Took me many years to recognize it. Many years to make that point of view. My uh, hope is, that now that we have all these arguments behind us, you know, we have gone through arguments of Paul Newman, arguments of Bishop Berkeley, arguments of uh, we did just now, Bigner. We have gone through arguments of our own a little bit, and you find your own arguments, you know, about what is consciousness. Ponder. Ponder it in various ways. However, ways you can find, you can, you can think of pondering it. And then come back to the undebatable thing. Undebatable things are objects are waves and particles. The waves are waves of possibility. They do reside in a domain separate from space and time that can be defined. Communication instantaneous versus communication taking some time. So there are two discernible domains. There's, these are absolute, undebatable positions of quantum physics. And the other undeniable position of quantum physics that the observer, without the observer, there is no measurement. Observer is doing something, undeniable position of quantum physics is that there is a change in the knowledge of the observer that cannot be debated. There certainly is. And now you open yourself up to, okay, so what makes this change? There is also undeniably a force or some kind, some kind of agency that has to be non-material that is in place. That is also undeniable. Why? Because for human proof mathematically that material forces can never change potentiality into actuality. These are undeniable. And then, start pondering. Especially in terms of bigness paradox, in terms of the paradox of dualism. Is it really tenable? Is it really satisfying to think that God from a separate realm, like David Bohm himself, he was thinking as a dualist, 
cannot help it. It's a natural thinking. Don't deny it. It's a natural thinking. Because it's a natural experience that we have. What do we do when we are in distress? What do we do? I tell you what I do. I had one point a guru who gave me a mantra, and that mantra comes to me naturally. And I repeat that mantra. This is why it's called a mantra. It, it tra means protect, and one means mind. It protects my mind. Immediately it comes to me down. So Guru has done a good job. Gave me a good mantra which protects me from such calamity. You know? Really works wonderfully. So what is the tendency from that? I myself have that tendency immediately to personalize God. Right? We might as well be simplistic and say, God is giving me protection. And we all have that tendency. Who wouldn't like to have a godly mother who gives us nourishment? offers our rest to feed us milk. Who would like such a thing? I would love to have it. It's natural. It's to be human to want that. Okay? But that does not mean that that is reality. Does it? Does it? When I need to change, when I need to change from my negativity into positivity, isn't it better to realize that this God is ruthless? This difficulty that I am having in accepting that I need to change, my ways are just not working to make me happy anymore. And I better realize that reality is not going to do it for me. No God is going to play favorite and everybody is going to accept my problem. My defect, my anger, my losing temper all the time, and I have to make some changes, right? If I don't, if I go on believing that this God who protects my mind in times of danger is also going to make other people change their mind about me, so that they just agree that, oh, I mean, it's negative, but so what, he's so lovable other times, you know? It ain't going to happen. So I take responsibility. That's the difference between recognizing that no, I create the reality and I have to take responsibility. At the same time, notice how dangerous it is to think that I create reality and, and I create reality. I have the ability to create reality. How dangerous is that? Because, because then I get the idea that I can create reality with whatever I want in a personal way, right? That also is not true. Because I create reality, so I want to create wealth for myself. I create reality, so I want to create a big house. I want to live comfortably and, you know, I can get into that. And of course, I realize immediately, no, that's not going to happen either. So at once we have to recognize that yes, I create reality, and yet, I don't create reality. And why don't I create reality? Because I am that. But remember what that is. That is a potential unity. <coughs> That's the potential unity. It's the potentiality in me. The unity consciousness is there, and I am that unity consciousness. No doubt. What you should say clearly, you are that. No denying it. But remember, they did not have the word potentiality. So what they forgot to tell us is that you are that potential. That's potential. That's the only word that is missing. This Words are so empowering. You are that. I am that. The wishes of the body said that. Beautiful. Jesus said the same thing, my father and I are one. Again, he forgot to tell us that yes, my father and I one are one. Potentially. Potentially. If I remember the word potentially, what happens is that I become immediately aware that it is up to me to actualize that potentiality. And it is not 
after we all do well. Why? Because remember, quantum physics reminds us constantly. Ultimately, the world has to be that probability element of it, that uncertainty element of it, that somebody reminded us, right? That is very important to remember. We cannot control this. If we did, we would become like scientists of the age when Francis Bacon said, knowledge is power and we can have that knowledge and we'll predict and control the world. And look at what that God is. That God is out of the land, that God is global warming, and all this stuff. No, we cannot control. We cannot have total control. So it's always subtle. I am that. I have access. I have to understand how to gain access. But I can never gain total access. And that is why no individual person can be God. It's not that way. But individual person can access this power, this downward condition, this ability to choose. And it is our job to discover under what conditions we can access. If we can access, it's great because I can choose to be happy, I can choose to heal, I can choose a better world, and I can create a better world. All of that is true. But there is subtlety everywhere. And it is the subtlety that you have to go on discovering, and go on discovering, and that's what makes us a quantum activist. So quantum activist is one we use quantum principles very carefully. Tries to access downward causation. This power to choose. Very carefully. Always remembering the subtlety. Always remembering to live the subtleties of it. And tries to change the world with us that subtle remembrance. And that's what gives us all. That's what we call walk your talk. Because you, you, you never know what you are working, nor do you know what really you are talking. So you never can talk in a definitive way of the righteous leaders that tell us, oh, do this, and this will happen. We never can talk like that. Yeah. We talk differently. We talk the language of creativity. We talk the language of process. Follow a process and something may happen. Something is likely to happen. So it's a way of living. It's a way of understanding the world in a subtle way. We never forget the subtlety of the world. We never want to make it gross that this is this, that deterministic way of thinking of the world that Newton did. That's the childhood you have to give up. That's the world of the child, world of the irresponsible. We have to take responsibility for the subtle ways that the world is constructed. Then we will have it. Or we'll never have it. That in our way it's okay. Because we accept the fundamental uncertainty. We accept the fundamental nature of the uncertainty in order to have freedom. We are free because there is uncertainty. Okay. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. In the deterministic world, there is no freedom. Everything is known means there is no freedom. You can do things for sure means there is nothing to do for you, because it's already determined. You see, see the subtlety here? So creativity, very, by very concept means that there will be uncertainty. By very concept it means that, yes, occasionally there will be failure. <coughs> Nevertheless, the way this human being is constructed, when we do this thing in a quantum way, there is meaning, there is satisfaction. And it is this satisfaction that we go through. <coughs> a satisfied life. There's a beautiful story about Buddha. Buddha initially thought, after his enlightenment, that everybody should go for enlightenment. There was no other, no other reason for human life, going for enlightenment. But then somebody said, but what about Vyastha? If Vyastha, Vyastha means household. If 
The householders don't have, don't do their job. Then where would these people who are sitting in life in the it's also prescribed that they got to be beggars, they have to beg to the householders for them. So somebody said, but if the householders don't exist, what would the beggars do? What would the land shakes, where would they find their food? So Buddha thought, thought about it and said, ah, there is a role for the householders, they should go for satisfaction. Beautiful answer. Go for satisfaction. Go for satisfaction. So, so this is the same. There are two choices to live the human life. One choice is, as I said in the earlier hour also, one choice is that you will not it. If you're ready for it, that's what you should do. And we'll define it better and better as you go on. But if you're not there yet, please don't waste your time to be enlightened. That will come. It will have its own time. You'll get so bored with the world of the householder that you will denounce it. But until it comes, don't try to do it. It's a waste of time. You won't be able to give up accomplishment. If you want to stay in the world of accomplishment, the strategy is to aim for happiness and satisfaction. This is why we teach happiness psychology. This is why we teach happiness economics. And if one phrase we can give to quantum activists, it's the activism of the happy person. Okay, thank you. One question, sir. Sure. <laughs> Did not the historical Buddha, Buddha, Gautam Buddha, mean vipassana for satisfaction as a process? He also, I feel, he also meant vipassana as a process towards the happiness which you meant, satisfaction which you meant. Yes, also. We'll come back to all these kids. I mean, this is not the end of it. Post lunch will be a continuation of uh, Dr. Goswami, but before that, we have. Mr. John Gallagher giving us his brief message for the day. Over to you. Mr. Swami, uh, since he was at the University of Oregon, uh, when I met him the first time, when I read his books uh, as we've gone along, it's, uh, it's been an amazing experience. It's been a journey for me just to read the next book that was coming along and uh, try to keep up with uh, all of the thought processes that he shares with us. But one of the areas that I wanted to talk about just briefly um, is an area that isn't as complicated perhaps as uh, some of the things he's talked about so far today, and that's just subtle energy. And I just uh, retired from my uh, prior employment. I had 26 people who reported to me, six of them here in Bangalore, which has given me an opportunity to be here three times before in the last 12 months. Uh, but uh, one of the things that was really obvious in the messages that I got back from those folks was the subtle energy. I never told any of them that I loved them. But what came back in the messages from them was they heard it. So the subtle energy, you know, you can experience that if you walk into a room and there's a lot of commotion going on. You can feel that subtle energy. But each of us has the opportunity to share the love that we have without even saying the words. And so it was, it was a humbling and an amazing experience to get the words back from the collection of folks that I work for who felt supported, that felt encouraged, felt encouraged to grow. And uh, it's all about that subtle energy. So know you have it, use it, it's powerful stuff. So back to uh, Dr. Kaswami. This is Ellie Rivera. And uh, I come to you from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Probably not one of the places many people know of. I always say it's near Chicago, although I'm not a big fan of Chicago. Uh, however, I think it's, it's quite appropriate to uh, be up here sharing because I think what we're talking about and where we're heading, I'm a prime example of how that works. Perhaps you can explain 
how it works, I, I have no idea, but I can share the story of how I'm here today. I think it was about four years ago I watched What the Bleep Do We Know. Uh, it was at a time where I was working full-time. Um, I was in full-time enrollment at International Coach Academy. So my time was full, 70 hours a week plus. And I watched this movie, and I heard Dr. Goswami speak, and I thought, wow, what an amazing man. Right here, I, I, I don't know everything, I don't understand everything, but I feel everything that he's saying is congruent with who I am. And I said, one day I'd love to meet that man. And so fast forward uh, three and a half years, and I'm working for uh, uh, the Coaching Federation as an outreach chair, so I go into communities and explain you know, what we do as coaching. And I saw on his quantum uh, activist site that uh, he and Jim Alvino were starting this uh, uh, quantum economics business coaching. So I sent an email, I'd love to help in any way possible, really simple. Next day, email back, Mr. Alvino, hey, Let's talk. Three months later, we complete a white paper that I've introduced with very, very good results into the uh, International Coach Federation community, um, sharing with them, hey, this is really what's happening here. This is what, what you're teaching, what we're, we're doing as coaches is this. Um, and, and so go to Huntington Beach for the inauguration of the business, meet the two of these, fine gentlemen, and uh, Dr. Gusquami says, hey, come to India with us. I said, yeah, absolutely, I have a passport. Oh, you need a visa too, right? Oh my goodness, I, I didn't know, it was weeks, weeks away. And, uh, but I knew, I knew that would happen too. And, uh, and sure enough, you know, maybe a few days before departure when the heart's kind of racing, is it, isn't it? Always knew it would. And, uh, and not only am I here, with him uh, to support he and Jim's vision, and everyone's vision that, that I've met with, including your own. Thank you. And uh, I'm back in a place where I've never felt more at home. All, all of the values, all of the energy that I'm picking up here has been something since I was a child I could never identify. And so I, I told Dr. Goswami, he's put a language to that which I did not know how to speak. And so that is why I'm here. Today, I see that's pretty. That's pretty cool. So I'm Dr. Jim Almino. I'm one of the speakers, and um, my special media area, along with uh, Dr. Goswami, working with him, is quantum economics. But how he and I got to meet, you know, there's presumably chance, which we all know nothing happens by accident, and synchronicity. And it's the synchronicity that brought us together. And the difference between, let's say, a quantum view and a linear view. You know, I can point to how I, how I got to meet Ahmed by saying it was Shelly who introduced me to Deborah, who introduced me to Bob, who introduced me to Eric, who introduced me to RV, who introduced me to Raymond, who introduced me to JT, who introduced me to Jules, and through Jules, I got to Dr. Goswami, but we all know that what really was going on was behind my back and behind our backs. That synchronicity, that, that energy that is attracting us to each other. So at the time, I was hosting a radio show on Law of Attraction Radio Network. And Dr. Goswami, and I also had seen What the Bleep, of course, and read some of his books and admired him from afar of how wonderful it must be to have the intellect of the quantum physicist, you know, and he came out with quantum creativity, and I wanted to interview him for my show. And of course, he was, he was very gracious, and we, we had a really nice interview. And then we decided that we'd have another interview, and we talked for an hour or more, and I said to Ahmed that you reminded me, you reminded me of the joy I used to derive from intellectual discussion. My background's philosophy, I have a doctorate in philosophy, I used to love to this, this abstract thinking that we're engaging in today, that turned me on, that impacted me. That's one of my karmic propensities. That's what I love to do. I love to do that and I love, I love to teach. So 
Some time went by, some time went by, and quantum economics then emerged on the scene. Uh, Dr. Goswami's book on quantum economics, which was an interesting foray into economics and the business world for him. And I read it, and it blew me away, and I contacted Ahmed, and I said, we, we need to get together on this. And I would love to, with your permission, spearhead the business side of this. And you're, the points you're making in quantum economics are points that should be adopted globally. And I would love to help you do that. And he said, it couldn't have happened at a better time. And so we got together and we found the quantum economics uh, business coaching. Uh, subsequent to that, we've done more interviews where I've done some recordings of them that I've called the Ojai recordings, Ojai, California. We did more recordings that we're going to be releasing to people. And we launched formally our company, as Ellie uh, suggested, uh, indicated on March 11th in Huntington Beach, which is, where, which is where I live. And it's just been moving, accelerating, accelerating uh, ever since. I'm so grateful to be here, so grateful for the people that have uh, brought us here and to be a part of the university we are are creating here is is just it's just unbelievable to me. You know, I've always felt my my philosophical biases have always been with the East. They've always been in, in Indian philosophy. And I have to say when I studied this stuff 40, 50 years ago, I understood the words but I didn't understand anything. And I always felt that India this is my home. This is where my spiritual roots are. I know that as sure as I stand here. Absolutely. Amit says at one time he must have been Indian. So in any event, that's how we that's how we have come together, and uh, with John and Ellie and a great team here with Shannon and, and Rita and Ivy and everyone who and Patrici whom I've had not had the privilege, pleasure, honor to meet yet, but I know I will. Um, we're going to make this happen. We're going to make this happen. We, we love your support. We love your support. You're here supporting us here, supporting Amit, and learning how to how to be a quantum activist. And our, our prayer for you is that you take that back and that you implement it into your lives, your personal lives, your business lives, with your families, because we believe so strongly in it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we look forward to your sessions tomorrow in the afternoon. I'll share with my own story. So um, I get invited to conferences all along. So that's not particularly surprising part of the story. Um, the interesting part is that, um, so I arrive here, and I'm initially a little bit of uh, this concept in the sense of, you know, this is a very big place. And um, so we have difficulty finding the, um, place where somebody will guide us to where the quarters are. So we did that. And then um, the person who contacted us, her wonderful uh, lady we found out later, uh, her name is Nipa, but she is not nowhere to be found. Instead, another person named Vita, also quite delightful, but you know, I haven't corresponded with her, so I didn't know who she was. But she appears and is very nice. So of course, I'm very nice to her too. <laughs> <laughs> but no impression. So the next day, I'm just taking a stroll, um, finding out what the uh, uh, what conference is about, and just looking around. And uh, so I go around the pyramid, and somewhere around there, I encounter Rita again. I don't quite uh, remember how that happened because. You know, I, I, I didn't have any aim or anything. So anyway, so we are talking and all of a sudden we started sharing visions. That happens sometimes, you know, it's a bit surprising. Uh, so anyway, and then she invited me to visit her lab and she talked about that. I remember even the first time we met. And so, you know, I went to the lab and it was very nice, all this. Uh, so that part is good. The conference itself in the meantime is taking place and we meet uh, a fellow named Patriji, whom everybody is very differential. So we find out he is a man who called, is called Bamarshi and um, 
I met quite a few of the mystic types also. I respect them very much, so that is there. Uh, nothing, no, no, no particular impression here. And then this, uh, my friend, Dr. Paul Bruma, who heads a university called Quantum University on the internet. So he's also one of the speakers. So he speaks, and a strange thing happens. After he speaks, Atriji and another guy. Atriji is not often, I don't know if you all have seen him, but he's not often that big a fellow. And this fellow is a Frenchman, French Canadian, at least 200 pounds of weight. He's tall, and Patriji and this other fellow picks him up on their shoulder and takes him around the room. <laughs> and I think, well, this is something. Because you know, one quality that quantum worldview enables you to understand very clearly, that at some stage of growth, personal growth, we uh, become very childlike. And this childlikeness is a very good diagnostic tool of these mystics. They're all around us. We, you know, oftentimes you cannot tell because they're very unassuming and very... A mystic will never say that they're special in the body. So how you know is uh, this childlike spirit comes out of them sooner or later. So I think, wow, okay. And then of course I get the same treatment when I finish my talk. And it's wonderful to be taken around the room on somebody else's shoulders because you feel, ah, you don't have any responsibility anymore. <laughs> somebody else is going to carry you. And that, exactly that feeling took place uh, the day after. I was in, um, in Patsuji and Rita and nine of us. She was there, and uh, Renji was there, and so we are all assembled. And uh, it's my, um, I think Patsuji asked me, okay, so uh, speak. So somehow I became a little emotional. And I started saying that, look, we have this uh, wonderful worldview, and how hard it is to let the West accept this worldview because it sounds so much like. Indian mysticism or Eastern mysticism. And Westerners, you know, have created a little division. Ever since Rudyard Kipling wrote those words, East is West, East is East, and West is West, and the Twain shall never meet. Somehow, it, it, it had made an enormous division in the West of doubting everything that comes from the East. At least there is a major stream which maintains this. So I was complaining about that. And Patriji, completely unexpectedly, looks at me and says, why don't you start a university for time and spirituality? Just like that. And Seamus, I found out later he's the finance man of the organization. It is nothing like this, right? <laughs> and everybody gets up with applause. <laughs> and, you, and this university that I hope many of you will be students and patrons is uh, took its germination. So that's how I came to be here. But then uh, Rita suggested, oh, why don't we have a quantum activism to workshop, not only to organize the university, but also to immediately acclimatize everybody with what is actually going on with the quantum world. What is it? This is why it is impressive that you all, and I'm already so pleased that you were in tune with me, because that's what I felt. Um, and that has to be the key of building this wonderful reinvention, whatever you call it, uh, movement. The idea is that you know, India was once the spiritual cradle of the world, and uh, these things never stop. You know, the you know, theology, the theosophy, uh, there's a movement called theosophy movement, which is actually quite strong in South India. Uh, I don't know 
follow up, you have visited Adyar in Chennai? Yes. Many of you must have. It's a beautiful place. And um, one of their uh, visions is that every country has a place in the world just like every species, Plato thought has a body plan that we now have seen in the work of great scientists who are sure. So this uh, body plan for nations, and according to the theosophist anyway, the India has the body plan. The reason for India's existence is this integrative attitude that Hinduism represents. You know, Hinduism was not considered as a religion. It's a way of life. It's the integrative way of life. That's really what it is. And now quantum physics is exactly supporting that integrated vision that India once represented, that India taught to Takshila and Alanda. And now I feel that time has come of creating that again. It has been dormant, but we call that now. We call it potentiality in the unconscious. Time to make it conscious again. Okay? So let's take that in spirit. All of us will get that spirit by the end of the four days, and that's our vision, and that's our wish, and that's the one manifestation that we shall try. Quantum physics is science of manifestation. There's no doubt about it. The rest of the uh, workshop is about how to manifest, how to get in tune with this quantum consciousness. Round up all being, all experiences that we know now is the way of potentiality. There is no other reality than that. There is no other being than that. That is the one and only being. Our question is how do I get empowered with this fourth choice that manifests our dreams and vision? Okay? So it's big. And one of the things that we do in quantum physics is to think big. See, one of the things is that, you know, we can imagine. And why should imagination have limit? We always think, you know, infinite potentiality and infinite capacity. But sport we put the two things together. So when we do that, the first thing we need to do is to uh, recognize that our experiences are valuable. So we went into the domain of potentiality. Now let's come to the domain of actuality as it actually is. With scientific materialism, we have had a very short changed version of what manifestation is about. Because the objective part of the manifestation is only material object. Fully objective part is the behavior of the material object, because they are completely determined by these objective science that we call various names. But physics and chemistry are the most common names of Some point of the game, uh, probably in the 1950s, a uh, type of scientists who call them molecular biologists, they started saying that why differentiate between life and non-life, why not recognize that life also comes from non-life? That is, there is no distinction. And that started a kind of a new movement in science. Biology is chemistry, and the new era of scientific materialism started. New era of scientific materialism where the belief grew that life and consciousness are not special phenomena as was believed before molecular biology, but it's the same phenomena as the insentient, inanimate, there is no difference. But of course there is difference. As Niels Bohr, one of the architects of quantum physics, used to point out, you know, the mystery of mystery of life. And his example was very simple. Here you have a single cell. You put it in a petri dish and you can see it under the microscope, a single cell. And the cell dies. 
another cell, if you have two cells, one cell is still living, and its sister cell, identical, it dies. Side by side, the molecular composition is exactly the same. Nothing has changed. Yet, by the behavior, one cell is alive, the other cell is dead. So Bohr's point was that the molecular composition is the same. So what's the difference? So there must be a complementary aspect of the cell, living cell, that we are missing, that is missing from the dead cell. The matter itself, according to Bohr, could not be alive. There must be something else. Okay? So from a cellular point of view, we have to um, we have to discover what is that something else. From our personal point of view, we are much more complicated being. We don't have even the awareness of the cells that we are made of. But we are very aware about our experiences. What differentiates us from this microphone, from this chair, from this table. Those things are completely described by the molecules, the atoms, the elementary particles they are made of. We have seen this repeated. This is why when a philosopher, um, when philosophers of the brand holist, you know, they say, well, there is something more than that can be reduced even in this object. They say that there is a hole that you cannot break it down, quite break it down into its components. That's called holism. Scientists object. They really object and their objection I think is basically correct. Because the, this object can be described completely, completely in terms of the component system. It can be broken down in other words. But you cannot give the same argument for a human being. Why not? Because we know that we have internal experiences, and in particular, one of those experiences don't fit the label that we need when we say something is an object. When it's an object, we know exactly what we mean. We experience it. But in order to experience an object, there has to be an experiencer. And that's what we say by the I. I am seeing an object, or I am touching this object. Right? Clear distinction. I am the experiencer, and the object is that which I experience. That can happen with objects that are material objects, that can happen with objects of thought. I experience this thought, or I experience this emotion. Right? The distinction is clear. Scientists, being very clever, they cleverly at some point define this thing as subjectivity and slowly started other definitions. One of the things they brought in the picture is a phrase called subjective qualia. It almost sounds like an object, object doesn't it? Subjective qualia, quality of experience. In this way, they tried to underemphasize the importance of the subject in any experience. But they have never quite succeed because even the quality of experience suggests already that okay your quality of experience is not going to be the same as your quality of experience or your quality of experience. So subjectivity is being acknowledged and the usual example that is given of course is one experience that is quite scientific, namely the experience of color. And everybody knows that if I look at the red that he's wearing, it don't be the same red as you are experiencing. This is what they call subject quality. But you see how minor this has become? Okay, so if we cannot understand the difference of subjective quality from one person to another, what, why, should we make, why should we make it a big deal? We might even have explanation. Like, for example, I can say that, well, the retina there are various pigments, and my pigmentation is a little bit different than yours. You know, we know some people are colorblind, and all these theories are different. People try to explain the subject of quality by different scientific modalities of explanation. But that is just the point. And 
said the point why? Because we have to recognize that we are talking about something else. We are talking about an experience. The experience is qualitatively different than what is experienced. But this is one thing, one of the things that is very hard to explain. You have to do it. Because you have done it, you immediately hear the importance of it. But you have, if you have not done it, then I could never explain to you what an experience is. Think about it. It's impossible to explain because all experiences will be with the help of objects. Even when we say a subject, we make the subject into an object. And that's the only way I can say the word subject. In other words, as soon as you say it, this, the experience has disappeared. It becomes an object. So we talk about ego, we talk about the I, all as an object. But the actual experience of always is a subject that is experiencing. You are hearing me, you are understanding me, right? That experience can never be fully described in terms of what we experience. Same difficulty with consciousness. We had in the morning a little bit of discordance and that arose because somebody asked, what is consciousness? Think about it. Why the discordance? Same thing. That part of consciousness is it's only possible to label it. So like in Vedanta, there is the word Brahman and then there is a qualification. Sat, existence, Chit, awareness, subject of the breath and ananda, limitless bliss. Description. Do the description makes it disappear what consciousness is? No. It doesn't. That's why we continue to debate about it. But it tells you characteristics. And one of the characteristics that it plays is a very good one. The subject objects matter. We understand that there is a oneness in the world and whatever name we give it, we get the name consciousness coming from the angle of quantum physics because any quantum transaction is really a transaction from possibility, limited knowledge to actuality of the So it's a change in our knowledge, the etymological vehicle with which you know is consciousness, so we said well, consciousness is involved. And then we said consciousness chooses out of the potentiality, the actuality. See how we are creating a definition? And then we said consciousness is the ground of all being. So how that existence is coming back in? Yes, it exists, the potentiality always exists. Potentiality never goes away, right? This is the difference between potentiality and actuality. Do you see it? Actuality is experience. That comes and goes. I may be sleeping. I don't have experience. But does consciousness disappear? It's an assumption that consciousness remains, but it's a pretty good assumption. What remains? Consciousness. We say we are unconscious. But what is unconscious? Unconscious is the undivided state of consciousness. When you say we are aware, that's a divided state of consciousness. So now we are getting at something. These are the things that the ancient people were struggling to express. We are getting at something. So what happens in quantum measurement? Quantum measurement leads this undivided consciousness and is possible in that today we call unconscious, following Freud and his collaborator. Mm -hmm. We are Recognizing that this, what Freud called unconscious, is that what we are not calling the ground of being, ground of all being and all experiences. Unconscious. He really, he really should have named it unaware. That would have been better because awareness, chit, in Sanskrit, is that subject of its split. So, what is awareness? That's the division of that undivided, no same 
longer or less consciousness into something that has been divided, the distinction. Subject looking at object. Subject looking at object. Okay? Little bit clear? <coughs> but still not completely satisfactory because you will next ask, okay, but why, why this distinction? How does the same distinguish itself into one part that experiences in other part? How is this taking place? What is it in the way that the brain is built? That an observer with a brain looks at potentiality, because the brain is also potentiality. So look again, the potentiality looking at potentiality. We already went through the Geiger counter as potentiality looking at electron and we acknowledge that no, there's nothing special here. Potentiality looking at potentiality will not do anything, will not change the potentiality to actuality. So only material interaction. And then we decided that it's different with the observer because we see that yes, there is a distinction now. Once an observer has looked at the picture, a distinction occurs. We know that from our own experience. As soon as I look, the world certainly has distinction between observer and what you observe. That is one experience that undeniably occurs for every <coughs> human being. How? Tension. Struggle then struggle, so Schumpeter said it's fire. Well, it actually came from the point of Maya. Maya is the name that they gave the unknown way that this distinction occurs. They recognize clearly that the permanent truth, this is why they call that reality. Existing. What is the permanent existence of the world? That unseparated, undistinguished, inseparate consciousness and its possibility. Yes. We need more, uh, not able to understand much. We can clarify even more. Yeah, sure, sure. Little sure. cup, little cup, little cup. Mm. It's a difficult concept. A difficult concept. I'm glad you spoke up. It's not so clear all the time. What is subject? Yes, please. They asked a question before lunch. They asked a question before lunch. Ah, that's being the microphone. It will be easier. Sir, I asked a question before lunch. Ask a what? Question, question before yeah. lunch. Yeah. Yeah. Before lunch. Well, yeah. I repeat the question or do you remember? Yes. Say it again. Repeat. I have been doing it. I repeat the question or do you remember? Yeah, repeat the question. Ah, actually. Unlimited? Limit, li limitless possibilities. Limitless possibilities. Yeah. And actuality. And then actuality. Yeah. So as we have limitless possibility, so I gave an example that uh, since I am going to going for lunch, so there are limitless right, possibilities. Right, 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 right. I'm going to, by your intention that I want some food, yeah. you want to have that food and you want to manifest that food and all that. Now remember, in the macro world we have agents of manifestation and we depend on folks and etc. Right? So we call this the world with built-in uh, capacities where different things can be expected from different people to cooperate in terms of feeding. Okay? So it's a question of how you look at it. The materialist looks at it as people having been conditioned into various roles. And you pay the price, you already have come, you pay the price to be part of this conference. It's the job of the conference to feed you, and therefore they have hired the cooks. So it's just machine clocks up in various parts of the machine cooperating by prior arrangement, the energy of money that is getting you the food. See how they, that people work? For us, it's a different bit of thinking. For us, the <clears throat> believers in consciousness, we don't have to think that way. So alternative scenario, you take what you want to take. There's no preference for me that what is right. But an alternative scenario can be constructed, and this is important. 
This is very important if you want to move from the world of mechanism to the world of consciousness. So the conscious world we construct it like this. You have some time this weekend. And you ask the question, okay, what is a good way of spending it? Suddenly you see this advertisement that a woman named Lisa has put in a magazine and you say, imagine the coincidence of it. Please, really. It's interesting, right? So many magazines, so many advertisements. And you look at this particular one. You say, that is very strange, meaningful question. We even have a name that Carl Jung, the psychologist, gave to this. He called it synchronicity. See, a, a physical phenomenon is taking place, right? Called the putting the advertisement in a newspaper. Nothing to do with what happens to your mind. <coughs> but seeing it, the intention grew in your mind that, oh, this sounds interesting and I should go. Did it? It did. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. And because you have been invited here, Vita in the meantime has arranged all these things. Now look at the cook situation. The cook doesn't know that you will be fed. What is the cook's motivation in all this? The cook is a spiritual person. The cook is interested to be here because there is a man named Patruji, whom everybody respects. He teaches here. That's the reason the cook is here. Otherwise, this cook would not come here to, to cook. So this cook comes because of a meaningful coincidence in him. Because a man named Patrick decided to live in a place called Pyramid Valley. And why the Pyramid Valley? Because another man sitting here, he decided that he would build a pyramid around this man Patrick. So look at how coincidences build up coincidences on coincidences. Heads of synchronicity adds up to make the simple fact that there was a lunch break and you got fed. 